We're good. But just, just this, this thing about why Jesus came, and it, He said it in His own words, I came for all of these reasons. And, and one of those, or a few of those, I, I talked about last week. He came to bring division in a sword and for judgment and to fulfill the law and the prophets. And some of these things are not as easy to understand. And I had a whole other message pretty much ready to go. And I feel like something just kind of came in and said, no, you need to do this one first. And so I wrote two messages this week. I have one ready for next week, just so you know. I think, I think we're good. But last week we saw how Jesus came to bring division in a sword and to bring judgment. And like I said, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets and his, in, in a short amount of time just tried to unpack those things and make them a little bit maybe more understandable. But what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read a lot of Scripture. I know some of you really, really like that. It's good. But I'm going to read a lot of Scripture, but I want to tell you just a, a little story first. If you can imagine four people, four, four guys in a, in a guide, somebody who thinks they know where they're going, and they're out in the deep woods, and it's time to get out of the woods. And you got, you got these guys, and they're, you know, they, they probably seem like they're going around in circles, or they're, they're going around lakes, and they got to cross over things, and over logs, and into ravines, and out of ravines, and they're all over the place. And a couple of the guys are starting to talk to each other, and they're thinking, does this guy know where he's going? Because it doesn't seem like he knows where he's going. And so what happens in, in this little group of four guys and a guide, there starts to become division in this, in this little group. And they come to a spot where they just kind of got to have a meeting and they got to talk about this and, and ask this guy, you know, do you know where you're going? And he doesn't say a lot. But two of the guys, they decide to uh, pack it up and they're like, you know what? We're going to just take our chances and we're going, to, we're going to go our own way. Because it's going to be about as fruitful as this guy who seems to be leading us around in circles. And so there's two other guys that are left standing there and they're, they're kind of not 100% sure what to do. But they're standing and they watch, they watch these other two who think they, they can make it on their own, so they leave. And one guy's standing there, the other guy asks him, he goes, Why did you stay? He goes, because he's got the map. That's it. Who cares where he's leading you? What matters is he's got the map. He knows where he's going. He knows what he's doing. Do you want to be with the guy with the map? I'm going to read from John chapter 6. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to start in a, in a spot. And I'm going to stop along the way, maybe every, every verse, every few verses or several verses. I just want to talk through this a little bit. But in John chapter 6, if you've got your Bible and you look through this, what you're going to see is that Jesus feeds 5,000. That's significant. Jesus, after that, walks on water. It's also significant. But then they came looking for him. And we're going to pick up in John chapter 6, verse 25, and read through 69. And in verse 25, it says, When they found Him, Jesus, on the other side of the lake, they asked Him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered. He didn't tell them what they wanted to know, but He said this, Very truly, I tell you, you're looking for Me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. We're going to think on that for a second. I'm going to talk about the signs in a minute, but Jesus is calling it out. He didn't answer their question straight up. He's calling them out. And the first thing that I want to just bring to us here today is aren't we sometimes like that with Jesus? Aren't we like this with Jesus? What can you do for me, Jesus? Or I'm following you because of this, but not because of that. And we, like those who kept their eye on Him 2,000 years ago, are often looking for Him to satisfy the needs of our flesh in the here and now. And that's, that's our reality. And so, if you're taking notes, maybe the Holy Spirit will speak to you today. Or maybe on your phone, or maybe in your heart. But there might be some things that, that get said to you today that, that you want to take note of. 
And I don't say this or any of this or bring this to you to cause shame, but more revelation. That, that we become aware, Jesus, would we have spiritual eyes to see today? And you'll see that in a minute too. Because I really believe that He cares about us in the here and now. I'm not saying that, that He doesn't, because I really believe He does. And I think we've got lots of testimony in here to, to prove or demonstrate that He really does care about us right here, right now, and He really does feed us. He really does bind us up and heal our wounds. But He knows better than we do that this life is short, it's fleeting, and it's temporary, and there's more. The life to come is eternal. And Jesus wants to satisfy that. Your eternal destination is His greater concern. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And I want you to, to think this too, that He works tirelessly to get us to focus and see eternal things. So He says in verse 27, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. So He's already starting this conversation. He's driving this conversation this way, which the Son of Man will give you, for on Him God the Father has placed His seal of approval. He said, do not work for food that spoils. That's the things of this world. Don't work for the things of this world. Work for food that endures to eternal life. That's the, the things of God. And sometimes all we can see is the food of this world and want the big banquet, but we don't focus on the things of God. We don't see what always He wants us to see. So then they asked this, uh, this question. And they said, what must we do to do the works God requires? And you would think, ah, oh, well, that seems like a pretty good question. That seems like a fair question at first glance, but what they're really after is simply performing the right ritual, saying and doing the right thing to gain God's approval, maybe just to get more of that food. And sometimes I think, you know, this is one of those things that, and we all do this, this is the human condition. There's something that has to be done, and a lot of times we're looking for, well, what's the minimum that has to be done? What's the bare minimum, right? We're kind of, when you're in school and you're a student, what's the lowest number of points I can get and still get an A? Or avoid an F. <laughs> Whatever. But aren't we looking for that number? Aren't we looking for the bottom number all the time? So Jesus, what do I got to do? What things can I do? What things can I do just to, to get this, just to make God happy, to get His approval. But Jesus answered, and this is one of, my, one of my favorite verses in this story. He said, the work of God, and, and in here the, the word work, it's, like, it's, it's just that simple. It's, it's a task, it's a deed, it's an action. That's all it is, okay? It's what you would think work is. What, what do I got to do? It's my performance. What am I going to do for you to satisfy you? <clears throat> Excuse me. And he said that the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. That's it. That's it. He says the work of God is this. You want to do something for me? You can't. <laughs> what can you do for me? Do you know what you need to do? You need to believe me. I'm the guy with the map. And so remember the blind man. I talked about this last week. The blind man is in front of the, the teachers and the elders and he's, he's getting all this the questioning and you know, he's kind of on trial basically. You know, who did this? When did this happen? Were you really blind? I mean, they're just going after this guy. Jesus finds him after they kicked him out. Jesus goes and finds him. He's got some other guys around him. And Jesus, he just says, do you believe? And the guy said, tell me what to, you know, who to believe in. He didn't say, what do I do? He said, who, you know, basically, who am I going to believe in? And Jesus looks at him and says, me. What did the guy do? He dropped to his face. And he worshipped Jesus. That's what he did. No further questions. He fell at the face of Jesus. He says, tell me, sir. Jesus says, I am he. Is that enough? 
Is that enough for us? But these guys, though, that Jesus is in front of in in John chapter 6, it says, so they asked him, what sign will you give then that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Now they're asking Jesus to do some work. You see that? What do we got to do to to satisfy God? But what are you going to do to prove that you're even on His team? And just a reminder, and I said this would be significant, at the beginning of John chapter 6, what did Jesus just do? And these guys were all there. He fed 5,000 people. And yet they come to Him and say, well, what are you going to do? What? Are we not watching? Are we not paying attention? And just so that we can get poked a little bit in our spirit here, sometimes we're like those guys. Sometimes we are. He's already been doing stuff. He's already sent us messages. He's already shown us. And then we come back and say, well, what are you going to do? He's been doing it. We just need to ask him, God, will you open our eyes? And so they continue on. They say in verse 31, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And I'm thinking Jesus is going, I'm so glad you brought that up. Jesus had something to say about those who ask for a sign. So I'm going to interject in in the story a little bit. And I'm going to have you look at Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 41. And I'm just going to say this. We need to be careful before asking Jesus for a sign. Okay? Again, are we watching? It's better to ask Jesus, can you open my eyes? But he says here, and this this story is the sign of Jonah, and some Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. So who is it that asks for a sign? Jesus is going to give them an answer right now. And he said, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. So Jesus called this out. He said it would be a wicked and adulterous generation. What does this mean? So to be sure, they saw the signs. It didn't escape them, really. It's not that they missed it as much as they ignored it. And sometimes that's true for us, too. It's not that we miss it. It's that we choose to ignore it. Ignoring it, like grabbing a hold of or or paying attention to something or anything other than God, or that just wasn't the way you wanted it delivered to you. And I'm going to tell you this too, because this convicts me. That other thing that sometimes we're looking for, or that, that thing that we grab a hold of or pay attention to more than God, is sometimes ourselves. Sometimes it's our own lives. Do you remember last week I talked about the scripture? that said, unless you hate your mother or father and your sister and your brother, and he says, yes, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Well, just to clarify, if you weren't here, that hate is love less, okay? You have loved your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, even yourself, love that less than you love him. But when we elevate ourselves or our need or anything above Jesus, what are we going to do? We put Jesus in our shadow, that's not where he needs to be. Amen? So we need to put him above. He always needs to be above. So we don't even want to be distracted by our own lives. Seeking after anything other than God, this is wicked and adulterous toward God. Does that make sense? Seeking after anything more than God, putting anything in His place or above Him that is wicked and adulterous toward Him. And we do not want to be that. So, they're saying, Jesus, if He could just round up some manna from heaven, maybe we'll believe because we really need a sign. 
Jesus is not here to do as He's commanded by anyone. Do you see that in Scripture? Jesus is not here to do as I command Him or you command Him, the Pope, the President, it doesn't matter. Jesus is not here to do as He is commanded by anyone. Not the crowds, not the Pharisees, not his followers or anyone 2,000 years ago or us today. And I'll even say this, if you look in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, Jesus even rejected Satan's temptation to that. And so watch this. We're talking about division. This is a story. Watch what happens here. All Jesus has to do is begin speaking truth. And He does that in our lives. We need to receive it. And so you understand, I'm going to read a verse here, verse 32. But what He's about to say here, Moses was often given credit for the manna in the wilderness, even though they knew who gave it. Okay, Even though the Scripture says that it came from God. But here's what Jesus says. In verse 32, he said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. And he's setting this up. He knows what he's doing and he knows who he's talking to. And he says in verse 33, For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The manna that came in the wilderness gave life to the nation, right? It gave life to the nation. Jesus, the true bread from heaven, he just said, is going to come and give life to the world. It's bigger, broader. Jesus is a type of manna. And so, of course, because they want this, sir, they said, always give us this bread. They still don't see it. But does it sound familiar? The woman at the well, Jesus is talking about the water that he will give. Well, give me that water because I don't want to keep having to come to this well and keep drinking. There's something spiritual that God wants to give us and sometimes we can't get past the flesh to see it. Give us eyes, Jesus. Please give us eyes to see. So in verse 35, then Jesus declared, He just says, I am the bread of life. One of the I am statements. He said, whoever comes to Me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in Me will never be thirsty. I'm not just saying this because these are familiar words to us. We can easily become so familiar with these words. You've you've read these in your devotions. Maybe some of you since you were young, maybe somebody in this room is hearing this Scripture for the first time in your life. I hope so. But we need to be careful with that thing that gets so familiar that we just gloss right past it and we don't hear that Jesus just said, I'm the bread of life. Come to Me and never go hungry. Whoever believes in Me will never be thirsty. That is spirit. Let's not miss this today. Amen? And He goes on and says in verse 36, but as I told you, you have seen Me and you still do not believe. And that, I believe, is because they were so familiar. In the familiarity with Jesus, just hanging out, watching Him day to day, they couldn't grasp what He was doing. And like I said, sometimes that's us too. I grew up in the church. From a little guy till today, I grew up in the church. And some of you did too. And what I'm saying is that sometimes we have become so familiar with Jesus and hearing His words and hearing... I grew up hearing this gospel since I could remember I have heard this. So it's become very familiar to me. How long did it take before it became spirit to me? Are you with me? Today, what I want you to do as you look at this and you listen to this, that we move beyond the familiar thing and move into this has become spirit to me. This is a part of being born again from above. And so he's saying this. But as I told you, you have seen me and you still do not believe. And all those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, 
I will never drive away. And right here, the, this, this word for come, it can have a sense of arriving at, just being present with Jesus, being here. And, and I just like this, I often will bring up the crowds because there's something about the crowd, especially when you see that in, in, the, in the stories that we read in the Bible. We can be like the crowds that are just checking Him out waiting to see him do something spectacular, we can do that. That's kind of like hanging in the back of the crowd and you're just kind of moving with everybody and you know, know, in the back of the crowd you talk a lot, you don't pay attention a lot, you have your own conversations and you're just goofing around. It's like the back of the bus. Nobody's watching. You think Jesus can't see you in the back of their crowd? He could be walking that way and see the back of your head. Are you kidding me? Jesus is there. But how we act when we're in the crowd, we're in the crowd, back of the crowd, and some of us have just been hanging in the back of the crowd for years, for a long time in our whole journey. And I'll tell you what, today is a day or someday, maybe right when you get up and you leave this place, it is the day or maybe just in your spirit right now, you're going to have to push your way through to the front of the crowd. Because that's where you're going to get with Jesus. You're going to be a disciple. You're going to be a follower. You're going to be right behind Him right there. And you're going to stop listening to the babble that's back here. Amen? Are you ready to stop listening to the babble? Because this is a distracting babble and it's time to separate yourself from the back of the crowd and get to the front and get to where Jesus is. And start listening. But we can be like that crowd. And where are you in the crowd today? Where are you going to be after this today? He continues on, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. That's one of the I have come for this reason statements right there. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that He has given me, but raise them up at the last day. That's a good word. I hope you received that. You come to Jesus, He wants you with Him. He's not going to lose you. But listen to this, verse 40. And He says, For my Father's will, and please see this, is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. Could He be any more clear? Is such a good word. So today, find out where you are in that crowd. Find out where you are in the journey. Find out where you are in your heart and your faith and move forward. Because Jesus is saying that everyone who looks to the Son and believes shall have eternal life. In the back of the crowd, what, what they're doing is they're saying, I'm hungry. Are you hungry? When's he going to make some more food? I kind of want a turkey sandwich right now. And that's the flesh speaking. And somebody needs to say, you need to get up to the front because that's where the food's at. And I'm telling you, today, you can receive this or you can reject it, and that's up to you. I can jump, scream, cry. I cannot make you accept this word. Only you can. So in verse 41 it says, At this the Jews there began to grumble about Him because He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can He now say, I came down from heaven? But isn't it interesting that Jesus is talking to people who know Him and have known Him? Again, here we come back to the familiar They were familiar with Him just like some of us are just familiar with Him. They saw Him, but they didn't see Him. It's important at some point along our journey to see Him for who He actually is. Who is He? Can you say it in your heart? Who is He? Is He the Son of God? Is He the King of kings? Is He the bread that came down from heaven to give life? Is He the living water? Who is He? Move up from the back of the crowd and go see. Spiritual eyes are important. And He said, 
And I think Jesus is just being so patient. He's like, stop grumbling among yourselves. Jesus answered, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from Him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only He has seen the Father. And he continues, he said, very truly, and he says it again, the one who believes has eternal life. I'm the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. They died there. But here is a bread that comes down from heaven which anyone may eat and not die. Let me interject another scripture here. Exodus chapter 16, verse 15. It says, when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, when they saw the manna, they said, what is it? Could you see him just poking it? And somebody going, it's kind of sweet. It's kind of neat, you know. But they said, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to him, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. A foreshadowing of what was to come. These people in front of Jesus were having a what is it moment like they did with Moses in the wilderness. And, and maybe there are times that we need to pause and stop, especially when you're doing your devotions, and you need to have a what is it moment. What's going on? What's happening here? Jesus is telling him what it is by telling them who he is. Verse 51, again he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread is going to live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now I want you to kind of bring your drone down and get on their level a little bit right now and start hearing what they were probably hearing. Okay? Just, just think of what they're hearing. Jesus now is he's getting into some tough stuff. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. You can imagine it got probably a little bit passionate in that, that little crowd or crew that was there. And they're saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? I don't fault them for asking the question, okay? I don't. But the problem is they never move past that question to get to where they really needed to be with the answer. But Jesus knew the level of their faith. He knew their true intentions for coming to Him in the first place. And, and He was pushing on them. Does He push on you ever? Does He push on you sometimes? He should. You should feel pushed on sometimes. But I would venture to say that, that we are most often led, at least initially, by our hunger, our flesh hunger, and our flesh desires. Isn't that true? Quite often, if we're just going to be really honest about it, there's a lot of times in our lives that, that we have been moved by the flesh, the hunger and the desires that we have, but we really need a spiritual hunger. And we need to move to that spiritual hunger. We do. We need a spiritual desire. Physical bread has to become spiritual bread for every single one of us. Jesus was giving them an invitation and they refused to see it. Jesus has the ability to feed our flesh, like I said, and He does so wonderfully, beautifully, faithfully, and thank God that He does. I mean, I think about all summer long, the last couple of summers, hot dogs and hamburgers out there. It's, it's good food. It's a good reason to get around. But we have to move past hot dogs and hamburgers, and we got to get into spiritual food. That's what we need. It's kind of like Thanksgiving. It's coming up. You're going to have some awesome food. But when we start to really give thanks, then, then we've done something spiritual with it, and we need to do that. Jesus wants us to desire more. So he was speaking to the Jews, and these guys, they knew the Torah. They knew Jesus, uh, or what Jesus is about to say uh, is this is going to twist them up. 
Again, we read it like it's just familiar, but I mean, listen to this. He says, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and then I'll raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink, he's saying. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Could you imagine they just went, wah? <laughs> because what do they know? What does Torah say? No blood. They can't do that. They're like, okay, this dude is whacked. He's a Torah guy, and he's telling me, drink the blood. Drink my blood. And he's getting pretty excited about it, I can imagine, and passionate about it, telling them to do something that they know, we can't do this. Does he know that? But what does he really mean? It's obvious that he's not being literal, literal but, but remember, he's pushing on them. He's pushing on the boundaries of their faith and causing them to think. And he's talking about spiritual food. Just before the crucifixion, what did Jesus do? He got the disciples together. It was the Last Supper. And he took bread. He broke it. He took wine. He blessed it. He gave it to them to eat and to drink. And he said, this is my body. Take and eat. This is my blood. Drink it, all of you. In verse 57, he says, Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And he said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. You remember that Jesus came to bring division. It's happening right here. The faithful and the faithless will be divided. Those who accept Him and those who reject Him will be divided. And you remember, I was talking about last week, talking about those, those big holiday family gatherings, and you see it in your homes, you see it in your families, the faithful and the faithless, and you see the division, those who accept Him and those who reject Him, the division, it happens, and it's real, it happened right there. And so they said, on hearing it, verse 60, many of His disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? These are guys who followed Jesus. They were tooling around with Him. They saw the things that He was doing. They heard the things that He was saying. Conversations that they were privy to probably, that I mean, obviously not written here. They were near Him. But they still might have been back of the crowd. Guys, I don't know. And Jesus again, aware that His disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? In fact, if you look up that word offend right there, that word offend, it, it can mean a bunch of things, wrap it all into one, but it's like, does this shock you? Not just offend you, does this shock you? Are you tripping up because of this? That's, that's really, if it was modern language, because it's kind of like a, a stumbling right there, what was happening. And Jesus is asking, is this causing you to trip up? Then, what if, then He asks, what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where He was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. He's bringing this home right here. He said, the words I have spoken to you, they are full of Spirit and life. We have to hear that. We have to see that when we read the Word. So Jesus is telling them plainly. He's speaking about spiritual things and still they didn't see it. And, and even today, we might have arrived in the flesh, but we need to be here and leave in the Spirit. And God, may we have spiritual eyes to see what You are saying to us. And He goes on and He says this. He says, yet there are some of you who do not believe He's talking to guys who know Him. He's talking to people who have hung around Him. I remember for years I'm reading this and I'm thinking, this is just some random crowd. 
it took me a while to figure out these are people who know him. They've seen him. They know how he walks. They've heard him talk. They know how he talks. They know his mannerisms. And he says, yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. And he went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. And I think one of the saddest verses in this chapter, maybe the Gospel of John, I don't know, but certainly should be, but it says in John chapter 6, verse 66, he says, from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Do you know that we live in an age today that there are those who have walked with Jesus, gone to church, grown up in the church, and they are turning away. And they're saying no more. We have a more faithless nation today than we've ever had. And church, we have work to do. We have work to do. And it's going to start with you today seeing these words and making them spiritual in your heart and you seeing that what He has said is true. It's true for you. It's true for them. You have a testimony. You have people that need to hear who Jesus is. From this time, many of His disciples turned back and no longer followed Him. Do you see this? It doesn't say from this time many of the disciples. It says His disciples. His disciples. There was relationship there, but not faith. Division and a sword. He will separate belief from unbelief. He said, turning to the twelve now, you do not want to leave too, do you? He asked the twelve. And listen to this. And I find it remarkable that Jesus asked that question, first of all. But I want to give you a little idea of the scene here. The twelve, they just watched a number of those who had followed Jesus, who they walked with, worked with, talked with. They knew them. They knew their names. And they literally watched them walk away. Imagine that. There are people in your life who you love, who you know, who once followed Jesus, and you are watching them walk away. And sometimes you just have to. It's a sad moment. But you get to pray into that. And maybe, God willing, you'll get to circle around somewhere and you'll get to maybe fill them with faith once again. But these guys, inserting the humanity, watched people they knew and loved walk away. They knew their names. They knew where they lived. Their families. These were not strangers. Put that part into the story. It makes it gut-wrenching. You remember that Jesus is the head. They had to love those who walked away, but they had to love them less than they loved Jesus. They had to love Him more. Or they might have followed. But they stayed with the guy who has the map. They stayed with the guy who knows, if I follow this guy, I'm going to get out of here. And I've always imagined a moment between the question that Jesus asked, you do not want to leave too, do you? Just let that pause for a minute and listen to this. As they walk, watch their friends literally disappear in the distance, Simon Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that You are the Holy One of God. Peter is saying that, and I imagine with all of humanity, with a, with a heart that is grieving, 
what just happened here, the division and the rejection, the decisions that were just made, Peter still says, probably maybe with a quivering lip, I don't know, but I don't think he was going, Lord, you, I, I don't think it was like that. I think he just, he stated what was true. And I want you to ask that word and maybe have that be on your lips today because this, this is eternity. This is accepting or rejecting. And he came to bring division and he will divide those who believe and don't believe. But you can say, Lord, to whom shall I go? Who am I going to follow? Who's got the map? Because you do. You have the words of eternal life. And that's the truth. And he is the Holy One of God. It's a powerful confession. I'm just going to say, if you're teetering anywhere on your faith today, I hope that something has become more solid for you. That you're thinking, you know what? I need to make this confession today. I need to see with spiritual eyes and to say, Lord, to whom shall I go? Do you believe that what you just heard are words of eternal life? That Jesus is the bread that has come down from heaven for you to eat and to live. I hope you do. And I hope today, if you've been teetering, if you've been waffling, if you've been wondering, that today you stand. And when you stand, you make it solid and you make that confession. And you say, Jesus, today I choose to believe. Heavenly Father, we love You. And we thank You. You have given us the words of eternal life and You could not have stated it more clearly than what you did right here. It's not that you didn't love them who walked away from you, Lord. You did. You loved them, but they chose to walk away. Just like you love us in this place, each one of us, and you give us the choice to follow or to walk away. And maybe today, someone here will say, I've been in the back of the crowd. Holy Spirit, would You lead me to the front of the crowd? I want to be more than familiar with Jesus. I want to look Him in the face. I want to love Him. I want to follow Him. I want that bread. I want it forever. In Jesus' name. While we're singing this song, if you want to come forward, I'll be up here. We'll have some people on the right, maybe over on the left too, to pray with anybody. But if you want to receive Jesus today, if you want to say, I'm done waffling, I'm done hanging back, I want to make this known and I want to make it real and I want to do it now, come on up. Let's talk and let's do it. Amen. Why don't you stand, please?